Podcast. available worldwide, right? There's sort of a universe, right? Now we record it, there's a recording of it. All right. Good morning, everybody. Two uh, logistics announcements. Uh, most importantly, after this morning's session at 10 a.m., we're going to meet outside for a group photo. And uh, Louise Kellogg has asked me to um, announce that the people who are going to share her at the um, concluding panel discussion should meet up with her, uh, I guess, after the morning break, shortly after the photo. This is Great, and so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, chair the first session of what I think is an exciting workshop. We heard a lot about the challenges and in particular, you know, coupling involves around trying to understand the constraints on the surface process laws and trying to figure out how to implement those surface process, process the surface processes efficiently in parallel uh, algorithms for supercomputer applications. And our first two speakers this morning have uh, worked for a long time on those two subjects. We're going to kick it off with uh, Brian Unidas on reconciling landscape models with reality, a spectrum of success. Um, so um, I'm going to talk this morning about what happens when we take sort of these predictions these nice, very nice predictions and very nice models, um, and very elements of them, and, and sort of apply the, the predictions and some of the implications of them to sort of deal, see how well they hold up, how they sort of scale to sort of these, these sort of natural systems um, where we can actually go with the data and better understand how well we're actually, or what we can actually learn about nature. Right? So, um, just sort of. So um, what I'm talking about this morning is, a, is sort of what locations, spatial scales, time scales, or the models that we implement actually reveal information on how nature works and how sort of, you know, if they don't work, you know, or, or they don't work as well as we hope, what do we do with them? Sort of, what are some of the challenges? Right, so I'm going to start with essentially the conclusions that we have come to. Um, there are complexities in natural systems that limit the applicability of our simplified models. Simple, powerful decision tools, um, or potentially requires some sort of you know innovative ways to think about how we can adjust them better to capture physics of what, how these landscapes actually work. Um, 
And finally, I also want to point out that, you know, a big sort of point is that there's not going to be a single equation or approach that's going to drive all river systems and focus on bedrock river systems. And thus all landscapes, all environments, tectonic and climatic around the world, right? And so we have to sort of have this thought or, or this sort of framework to allow us to be flexible to think about what these different systems are trying to model um, and, and how we think about them. So I want to start. Um, so we've heard a lot about this stream power model. I re recognize not everybody in the room might know where it's rooted in, where it comes from. I'm going to start with some just quantitative background um, and build sort of that, that model that, that's just used so ubiquitously in the stream power model. So the root of this is really uh, what I like to call a proxy model. So this will be sort of my tongue tends to um, trip over some of these things. I'm not going to say it. I can't even say it right now. I knew I, I knew I would screw that up. Um, that is perhaps rooted in some physical arguments, right? Just saying that the rate of erosion of a river system is equal to the shear stress of the river, possibly raised to some power, times some erodibility, some erod erosion equation, right? And this is uh, sometimes we add a threshold, right? Just as John Braun sort of pointed out, stuff's not always happening. Um, and it's kind of covering my figure, um, but there are some uh, phys physical reasons to start with sort of this, this uh, postulate, right? We should imagine that the shear, I'll keep going, I can just talk. So I'll just keep going. Um, the shear stress of a river, we might think, is, is a, a strong control on, on the river's ability to, to take a you know, jointed block of rock and sort of pivot it or slide it out of place. Right? That's a fundamental type of process that we deal with. Also, shear stress is known to uh, strongly control sediment transport dynamics. Right? Um, the more shear stress, the more sediment you can use, you can move, the bigger sediment you can move, and that's, and that's, and that's, and that's through the river system can abrade. You know, sort of sandblast the bedrock or you know, bounce along the bed and, and induce damage into the rock. So there's some physical sort of um, reasons to, to start with sort of the shear stress assessment. We don't know very well double shear stress. Does that really mean you double erosion rate? That's dependent on sort of the process of the rock formation, as well as what this sort of K is. So what goes into calculating shear stress in a river system? Um, I like to tell my students that are just learning it, you can think of this as float parallel, parallel component, the weight of the water in the river channel. The density and gravity, I think we know those pretty well. I spent a lot of time talking about those. This N term is a, is a, a frictional coefficient, you know, how rough the channel is. Um, um, can be important, but the, we're, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to ignore today. Q here is our water discharge, right? How much water is flowing through your channel, direct connection to climate. Our W is our channel width, right? If you sort of narrow your channel, you're, you're, you're exerting those, those uh, forces over a smaller area, so you have a higher shear stress. And then finally, slope, which we've seen a lot of so far because slope is you know, the gradient of the river and then you integrate it up and that's what gives you your topography. So to get to the general um, generalized stream power model, we make some sort of assumptions. We say, well, look at river systems, they tend to get wider as you go downstream. So we're going to scale width with drainage area. Water discharge tends to get bigger as you go downstream. Right? So we're just going to put these parameters in there, likely you know, function of precipitation, hydrology physics, stuff like that. Um, and we're going to lump all these parameters with these parameters and get this equation that we've seen a lot of. Right? So we start with some physical theory, and we end up with this you know, nice, powerful, simplified model. So what I want to talk about is are we doing this sort of water discharge, fundamental control on shear stress, this channel width, this rock erosion efficiency, how we translate shear stress into erosion? Are we doing that right in our models to calculate shear stress? If need be. Um, I guess I kind of kind of mentioned all this. I do want to point out, I'm not trying to throw a wrench in the machine. Um, 
I look at it more as taking that wrench, sort of cleaning some of these knobs, right? So we're fixing things that might be a little loose in our, in our system. Um, anybody that's worked with machinery knows if you tighten that knob that was loose, the whole system can now work with the wrench, right? And, and there's the potential for that to happen. Right, so my outline, we're gonna start with talking about the rock type wrench, erosional efficiency. Um, talk about climate as well as channel width. And I'm gonna show a mix of some of my work and my students' works as well as, as, as other folks, including some people in the room here, um, that sort of provide field examples of, of their tests of these, these different types of wrenches. So first, lithology. Um, if you really wanna understand the evolution of the Earth's surface, you ever look at a geologic map, I think it's safe to say we need to understand how, how different rock types affect each other. If I went and handed this bucket to any geomorphologist in the room and told me what's the different K valleys in the rock types, I'd probably get a lot of trying to pass it off to each other, right? Um, it's a big question, but it's a big issue when you face, get faced with what's really going on. And I want to sort of motivate it with Small changes in lithology can have really big propagating effects. And this is a schematic from Adam Forte's paper from a few years ago. And I'm going to show some, some model um, um, results of this, but this sort of outlines a, a big part of the, uh, of, of the problem here. So we're looking at time, different river profiles through time. We're starting off in a soft rock. And then we erode through the contact and we expose our hard rock. Right? The river system is going to, the hard rock is going to, the river. The erosion rate is going to sort of lower because it's harder rock and the river is going to start to sink in. Well, that lowering of erosion rate, the river upstream of the soft rock sees that lowering of erosion rate, and then all of a sudden this starts propagating through the landscape. And so at any given time while this is happening, you get this you know, sort of spatial pattern of, of you know, steady state rivers eroding the rate of rock uplift and a decrease that propagates upstream of the contact, right, and, and then goes back to. You can think of the other case where you have hard rocks over soft rocks, exposed to soft rocks, you get really rapid uh, erosion that sort of propagates um, and, and reaches upstream of that contact as well. Right. So we can see this in landscape models. I'm going to show you this, this, this movie from Adam's paper. Up here is our erodibility map, our K, different Ks of the stream power equation. You can think of this as the evolving geologic map. This is our erosion rate, rock up rate is one millimeter per year, the red. So as we dip down to the blues, we go down an order of magnitude. And then we'll see the elevation. Right. Uh, works. Yep. So we can see we go from one millimeter per year, drop down to a tenth of a millimeter per year, and then come back to a millimeter per year, all in a few million years. Right. These are big landscape effects for only a five-fold difference in erosion. Remember from Arthur's talk yesterday, he sort of calibrated K factors were varied by two orders of magnitude, right? We're getting a tenfold change for a fivefold, fivefold difference in K. Our, our gain, as Jean Braun sort of pointed out, is greater than one, right? Lithology is important, it matters. Change your lithology, you have big consequences on the landscape. Similarly, if we have soft over, um, hard over soft, so we're gonna start with hard rock and we're gonna expose soft rock. You see you have a little bit more of a localized difference in, in your erosion rate, um, but again, pretty significant landscape change. The five-fold difference in that K goes from six kilometer high origin to a three kilometer high origin. For not very big differences. We have this challenge of sort of implementing these models and sort of these, these natural systems. And very hard to find a place on Earth where that has only one rock type only one erosion rate. You want to really understand the dynamics of the landscape because that erodibility is going to have really big propagating impacts. We have to be able to go to the field and be able to, to figure out what these values are. Uh, this is just a, an example of a river profile in Kai space in central Arizona where we can see that effect that Adam showed in his modeling of a hard granite layer poking up between a, a softer phyllite uh, system. And we can see that the phyllite has very different steepness because it's this propagating impacts of exposing this hard granite. Um, so these differences in erosion efficiency have pretty big implications. 
to attempt to, to shed some light and show you how we can potentially implement some of these models in, in real scenarios to shed light on this block type um, problem, we're going to go to central Idaho, where the Salmon River Gorge is cut through the central part of the state. I mean, what's sort of special about this natural experiment is that it cuts through a number of different rock types. We have the Idaho Bathlith, we have the Columbia River Basalt, we have different gneisses. Um, and as these, you know, this, this system sort of propagates through, it sets off nick points and, and transient incision into these different um, river um, uh, tributaries, and they're pretty much maintained within one rock type. So you can isolate the effects of different rock types on the same sort of Right, so we can look at these profiles. Here's the topography versus distance in an orthonice. And we have this relic topography, and it dips over into our, our uh, nick zone and then into this sort of new adjusted. Here it is for uh, a river uh, underlain by basalt. You get these much more discrete nick points in nice as well as in ranch. Check this out. You can help constrain um, this sort of modeling effort they're going to take by going out in the field and actually measuring erosion rates with cosmic rays and heat flies. And we find the relic landscape is eroding about three times lower than this new, newly adjusted, newly transient, or not the transient part, but the part that has seen this sort of propagating phase. It's about a threefold difference between the relic and the adjusted um, landscape in terms of erosion. So what we could do is, is take a simple stream power model and we could run it. Um, through parameter space, searching for sort of sort of best fits. And here's an example of a, of a pretty good fit of the stream profile as it um, feels that threefold increase in, in, in this case in rock uplift. It could also be a threefold increase in stream strength in terms of the answer. We're able to do a really good job reconstructing the modern river profile, which is the blue line with our model profile. By just by taking that relic landscape part, projecting it back to the surface as our starting point. Um, and then searching through parameter space, we find those erosion rates matching up and the topography all the way. Um, and so um, I put this plot down there, same, same river system and, a, and the absolute best fit model. Calibrated model, we get a value of K, uh, a value of M, and a value of N. And what's sort of interesting is something that we have to think about um, in this room is um, it's not just Ks. Ends vary by rock type as well, right? And so here is a river profile. It's in chi space. Sorry for the, the switch in, in sort of um, topology here, but uh, elevation versus versus chi space. And here's our sort of stretched out nick zones in, in the granite system. And here's our basalt system. We get an N of 0.67 versus an N of 0.22. Um, it might not be seem significant, but as Jean Braun pointed out, ends control sort of and have a big influence on sort of that landscape response style and, and time scales of the river, right? So um, blanketing a landscape with a single N may not be, um, and then trying to fit different Ks may not be appropriate if you have um, And we find this is consistent for essentially all gneisses and all granites, always less than one, over 30 profiles. In basalts, always greater than one, usually around 1.5, um, which is, both of those values of, 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 of sort of this 0.6 and 1.5 are significant. If you go back to that original physical sort of justification for using shear stress, Kellen did a nice sort of little scaling argument that suggested that if you're dominated by jointing, you might have an N of, of 0.23-ish. Whereas if you're dominated by sediment transport systems, maybe the abs would be higher. Um, these, these kind of can bounce around depending on the assumptions you make in your scaling, but they're, they're consistent with having different sort of end member um, ends based on your process of actual erosion. And we see this process in the field. When we go up, the, the nice, nice channels are nice to go up because uh, they give us a nice, a lot of information because the, the jointing is controlled by the foliation. We can actually see the shape of the pluck blocks and we can find pluck blocks with the foliation, the right orientation, and sort of match up, um, up where, where they're plucked off. We see it all over the place. We see plucking evidence of plucking. So if we go to the basalt and find the parts where the, the river channels hung up and, and limiting the incision, we get these very discontinuous joint, jointing, not a lot of plucking, and very smooth sort of abraded systems. We tend to um, 
suggests that we might be more dominated by these sediment tracks. Right? So this rock type controls the scaling between erosion and even slope. All right, so um, rock type variability is a first order influence on the rate and style of landscape evolution. Uh, we're starting to unravel how to parameterize this. There's lots of work to be done. So I want to point out that variation in rock type is not just differences in K. The exponents matter as well. Um, oh, because rock type dictates the dominant erosion process that we're trying to capture. Next, I want to move to, to the climate part. So if you go to Google Scholar, you turn climate, quantifying erosion rates, landscape evolution, some combination like that. You'll see something like this, climatic forcing of erosion um, and tec of landscape and tectonics versus dominance of tectonics over climate in Himalaya, decoupling of erosion and precipitation, coupled vari spatious variations and precipitation, minimal climatic control on erosion rates, climatic control on uh, bedrock river incision rates, or we can just, you know, throw the wrench in the machine and call on chemical weathering as the reason why climate controls river incision rates. So there's sort of two takeaways of this. If you want to get a paper in a short format, high impact journal, either find or not find a climatic control on um, Second of all, this is sort of a dog's breakfast when we try to reconcile this cue that we scale up to drainage area in our stream power in, in real landscape, right? Um, right, so the dog got, got confused and made a mess of things. So worked up about what climate meant. Um, safe to say we need some serious adjustment on how we approach climate models. And John hit on this uh, beautifully yesterday in his talk. The fact that it's weather that erodes, right? This is sort of a stream in Arizona that's water, the weather event that causes the erosion is not the same. Um, so I'm going to show an example uh, of, of where this might play out actually. And next, and then I'm also going to talk about um, another aspect of climate that was also brought up yesterday in the discussions. Climate changes for many of these things. The one that I'm going to talk about today is the coupling between these things. So I'm going to show, show a couple slides here from Roman D. Biasi's work in the San Gabe and Helen where the sort of Ben and the, the San Andreas hook up this nice natural experiment with some radius and drop up the Gabriels. And they went and measured erosion rates for cosmic sea glides and found this pattern of erosion rates. So great test. Now we can look at the river steepness and, and, and sort of you know calibrate this you know tectonic geomorphic uh, stream power model to, to really start to understand the system. And this is what they found. Uh, we have erosion rate, the approxy for drop up lift steepness and it does what we expect. We get more and more higher and higher rates of rock uplift, we get more and more steep channels. But then that relationship starts to sort of fall off, fall over, right? It starts to, to bend over. And, and their um, argument, their way of explaining this was what John hinted on uh, or talked about yesterday and it's that you have to actually consider the distribution of weather events to explain the sensitivity of don't we're gonna we're gonna predict the wrong wrong things. Um, but what I want to focus on or, or talk about is something we haven't really discussed, and that's this is a challenge in that when we change the topography, um, we change we change the climate. Right? And so this is somewhat motivated by Chris Olson's work where he took sort of the modern central Andes and shrunk them down them down to different elevations, ran global or ran climate models, regional climate models over them, found that when the Andes got to be between 70 and 90 percent, there was a threshold change in the way the atmosphere worked. That kicked, started kicking off a lot more convection, increased precipitation, and changed the distribution of the different species of plants. Um, and so to attack this, uh, my student Bridget Lynch, along with Chris Polson and his student Dora Shen, has been um, working to couple the weather research and forecasting model with a component called work hydro that we get from the ocean, run it over landscape and uh, uh, hydrology into land lab. And we can sort of allow this feedback to occur based off the 
Everybody out here seeing this, you know what this is speaking to. Um, so quickly, um, here's an example from the WERP Hydro page. This is the front range. You can see the 2013 storm. You can see that the map is going to start seeing increase in rainfall, and then we can see these river channels propagating the rain. So we're linking this sort of infrastructure into the GNSS app in a very asynchronous way. Works very well. Um, so what we've been doing is utilizing the Andes, not necessarily to recreate the Andes, but because then we can use all the model boundary conditions and things like that and just not have to guess it on each model. Um, and it's sort of created this sort of synthetic topography run along the latitudinal gradient. Um, and in these, we have sort of five different landscapes that we can bring worth down to a five kilometer scale. We model the, the weather propagating the hydrology through the system so that we can then Land lab, and, and this is a very much a, a number of different projects that are that are going on with this. I just wanted to share um, uh, what I think one of the in most interesting results so far, um, and that is just simply taking two different end member topographies. We can make them in, in land lab, and so we don't have to worry about different drainage and different network differences. Looking at 100 meters total relief versus a four kilometer high mountain, we look at the CDF function of water distribution, right? Um, and so I'm kind of putting this line here for reference because we kind of looked at recent slides here. Um, and we can see how in an equatorial climate, as you build from 100 meter to a four kilometer high origin, how it changes the distribution of your mountain and stars and your peaks at six hour leaps per month. Um, and we can see that there's a pretty, um, that there's a, a system gets wetter, but it gets wetter because the base flows are essentially pushed to a higher, high, some higher distance. The, the big floods, you know, your 10-year your flood, if you will, your five-year flood, don't really change as much as the base flow. So um, those, those sort of geomorphically significant events aren't really impacted by topography. Very different conclusions if you look at the subtropics. So here's our 100-meter topography. Here's our 10, our 10 meter per second reference line. We build that four kilometer, the entire distribution shifts. We go from this 10 per, uh, meters per second, essentially never being simulated, to being um, in the river system 17 meters per second, which is a long time of, of, of um, in terms of geomorphology, right? Usually we think of these events that only last for a few days. Go to the mid latitudes, it's even different still. And our shape of our distribution is entirely different. Our base flows go up, um, but also the way that, that the, the tails sort of fall off in the distribution change as, as, as we change topography. So simply stating latitude matters in this sort of tectonic and climatic system um, is something that we have to be aware of. Right? So cleaning up the dog's breakfast, it's becoming increasingly clear that a mean climate state isn't really going to Difficult to uh, translate into a geomorphic climate, especially weather erodes, not climate erodes. Climate and resulting weather patterns change over a range of time scales. Specifically, climate topography coupling varies with latitude. Because of this, we might very well expect a dog's breakfast if we start going to try to find these sort of climatic controls on landscapes and comparing and facing very different maps. Finally, I want to get to um, something I've been working on and thinking about for a long time, and that's the effect of channel geometry. I think when I say channel geometry, think of the width of the channel, right? We know that, that you narrow the channel, you can increase the density. So far, we've, this entire workshop here is focused on models that only allow slope to be the topographic parameter to adjust the channel geometry. But we know in shear stress, width can change too. Um, and we see it change in real landscape. So this is implementation challenge is how do we maintain this power of simplicity while recognizing that rivers are gorgeous and beautiful and we can change all these things. And it matters, just to highlight some field examples, is Wave and Avalok's classic paper from 2001 where they use uh, river terraces to construct the rock uplift rate um, uh, across the, the, the main frontal thrust in the, the, um, in the 
Himalayas, and they find there's about a tenfold increase in rock uplift um, as, as the river passes through this segment. But look what happens when it floats. It doesn't change. Tenfold change in order of magnitude change in rock uplift, slope doesn't change. Changes a little bit in the Bakaya, um, but not the tenfold change you might expect from this slope and then having to accommodate. Right? What's happening is the channel, if we look at distance downstream, the channel as it approaches this high uplift zone is narrowing, accommodating this extra rock uplift by, by narrowing. Right? So if you're going to try to use a stream power model, only allow slope, to model this system, right? you're going to have a bad time. It's not going to work at all. Right? And slope is not changing at all. We have a tenfold change in rock uplift. We need to sort of rethink how we handle river systems in the future. I mean, the Himalayas, you may have heard of it, you may have heard of the Himalayas as well. But it's one of those origins that um, we find a very similar strange sort of effect in, in, in southern Taiwan. If we look at these river systems, so Taiwan is, is, is propagating from the north to the south, so we have an age in, in landscapes, and so we can go from a young just emerging landscape, and then a, a, a you know, more steady state adjusted landscape as we move to the north. And we could go and measure channel morphology, and we see that slope does what we expect. As you go from the southern tip to the north, we see this five to six fold steepening of the river system, what you would expect from the stream power model. But we also see the channel widening five to six fold. The channel is getting wider as the river is steepening at about the same pace. Shear stress isn't really changing, right? That's breaking a fundamental assumption of what goes into that stream power model um, in, in, in when we make all those scaling arguments, right? Something fundamentally different is going on in Taiwan. Um, this K term um, is more complex than, than just a uniform value in, in, in some landscape. And what's going on? Why are rivers wider where they're steeper? The influence of sediment supply in these river systems. You build this relief, you start to pick off landslides, right? In a way, as we add, add that landslide material, now the rivers have to evacuate that before they start um, um, eroding bedrock. So, in a way, the hill slopes are, are, are dominating that sort of slope increase in demand with widening in, in the river system to move south. I don't want to just say things don't work and, and then move on. I want to come up with new ways that we can, we can approach solving these problems. And so a typical 1D stream power model works like this, where width just scales as you move downstream. We need a system that allows dynamic variation width. Maybe you have a propagating nick point, maybe you have an increase in sediment supply. So I use this principle of, of channel, river channel optimization. Um, I think I'm running out of go through this quickly, but it, it is, you can talk to me later about it, about the, the details, but the width, um, essentially only have to add one parameter. Right? I'm not making this super complex, I'm trying to maintain the simplicity, I'm adding one parameter, and, and we solve the sets of equations three times, one for the current channel width, one for slightly wider, one for slightly narrower. That gives us the direction, whatever one gives us the highest erosion rate, we, we assume is gonna entrench the channel the most, and that the, the, the system's gonna sort of be attracted to that sort of state and move in, in that fashion. Um, and so we can do this, and we can look at a, a dynamic river uh, a model uh, with an evolving width, so it's essentially a 1D river profile model, but that is accounting for the evolving width. And in this system, we're sort of sediment dominated like Taiwan, so as we increase rock uplift, increase sediment supply, we saw that sediment supply We change parameter space such that there's lots of bedrock exposure, the limiting factor is actually catching the rock in the system. The same exact equations are being solved. As we increase the rate of rock uplift here, our channel is narrow. Um, this has implications for sensitivity between increase in rock uplift, a fractional increase in rock uplift versus a fractional increase in steepness. Black line is our 1D stream power model. Whoops, the blue line is that same stream power model, but allowing for a dynamic width. It's less sensitive, less change in topography, or change in rock uplift. 
And then these other colored dots that show even less sensitivity are sediment dependent models. Well, so we can see why this happened or, or the sort of different uh, regimes, erosional regimes that these river systems end up in, where we have a fractional change in the wideness of the channel, how wide it is for a given drainage area, versus this change in rock uplift. Our detachment limited systems get narrower as we expect. In a place like Idaho, where we're limited by bedrock detachment. Whereas our sediment dominated systems get wider as we increase sediment supply. Perhaps like a place like Taiwan, where sediment transport dominates. So the spectrum of success and be able to reproduce these different river systems, I think, is because there's a spectrum of how river systems work, right? And we have to acknowledge that. We have to be able to implement that into our, our, our landscape. Right? Um, so in some environments, channel width can be a dominant control of erosion process. It's just as a dominant slope, maybe more so. Current 1D generalized stream power models don't really capture it. But I think there's some simple modifications that we can do to, to start capturing. So back to my original points, there are complexities in natural systems that can limit the applicability of our simplified systems or require some adjustments. There's not really a single equation, I think, that's gonna solve everything. We have to be aware of that. Right? This is gonna require flexibility in the way we implement these models. A little bit of situations like, like this, like my CEO part, right? Talking about flexibility, we have to have situational awareness. Where are we at? You know, where are we at in the world? What latitude are we at? What's the sediment supply relative to the rock strength and things like that in order to think about what sort of physics we want to make sure we're capturing. Right? And then finally come up with these innovative solutions right? um, to, 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 to figure this out. And then with that, I will wrap up and take questions. Thanks a lot, Brian. We got time for questions. I got a question. Yeah. So uh, what's wrong with chemical weathering? It seems like at least for long-term uh, climate fluctuations, if you have some Arrhenius dependency, you would expect that to be a contribution at least. Sure. Um, in general, when we compare physical and chemical weathering on a scale, chemical weathering is order of magnitude, maybe 20% of the rate of change. So we tend to throw it out the window. Um, but it's part of the mass balance that um, we should account for. I've tried to talk with geochemists and say, okay, can you give me an equation? If I can give you a slope or uh, physical erosion rate, precipitation, give me a rate of chemical weather. We do what we do, and we get capture a bucket of rocks, and then they're like, uh, well, there's lots of things that matter. Um, I could defer to John, John or Nicole on this point as well, because Uh, that was an awesome talk. Um, I just have one basic question with the Indian example of the dwarf bottles. Are there diagnostic signatures in the landscape associated with those different PDFs of the or CDFs of the discharge or whatever that you can pick out in the actual landscape to test that? It's tough because that I mean we don't have fully or we're not going to have fully coupled. We don't have. We've just been doing these sort of end members and anal analyzing discharge variations, erosion variations, um, and then thresholds. Yeah, in those situations, we do see differences. But in thinking about when they are fully coupled, which they're making progress, it takes the work of the whole cycle that we have to do that. We have a land lab for about an hour, and then we go back to the work. <laughs> um, right, and so the, 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 dyna the full dynamic coupling takes we can anticipate where, where it's going to go and what's going to happen. And um, I think that's the best I can do right now is we can anticipate that. I think the diagnostic would be we might have different temporal variations at different latitudes. But topographically, Brian, don't, 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 don't. Mike. So I just wanted to follow up on that, on that, uh, on that exact question because one topographic thing you might look at, 
Dimitri's log taught us that maybe that non-inherited erosion of the channel steepness could be controlled by the variability of flooding. Yes. So you might see a different phenomenon in that region. I think that theory is correct. Yeah, exactly. The question I wanted to ask you, or the, I guess maybe suggestion I had, is it's a really cool prediction that in different dimensional climate bands and different atmospheric physics, you can get that different CDF of flooding. Yep. But to get the CDF of flooding right, there's a lot of hydrology you got to get right. Yeah. We think, especially in the soil water balance, sure. So it's worth going and one thing you look at is the data on the stream displays. Oh, yeah. Do they follow those predictions? I haven't done a that. much easier way to find out. If that's true. It's true, but it doesn't tell you about how it may have evolved over time. So I think we're starting with that case as simple as we can, where that's, there's all that is in the work hydro, soil evaporation, and all that stuff. So we just make it the same at all latitudes. We don't want to have to interpret our results on top of that complexity. Just first start with that topography as a simple process. Then we can start adding, adding these other layers of complexity. Right? Uh, and from our work, that soil water evaporation mass is a common control, not the stream flooding. Well, this, yeah, I mean, fair enough. I just can add a little bit to the discussion about the Andes. I've looked at it um, between uh, around 30 degrees and um, in the wet and dry side of the Andes and looked at the distributions as well. Um, I can say that, for example, it doesn't really matter uh, what the distribution is looking like. I mean, if your uh, average erosion happens at the average discharge, that is not affected by the threshold. So that's the case in the Andes that you can use for, um, well, that doesn't tell us about the temporal evolution, like you said, but that is one example where you can compare the, the two effects of mountain uplift plus the climate. Thank you. Dan Schellep, the University of Utah. Thank you, Brian. It was a very good talk. Um, it seems like an important component of this investigation. Okay. It seems like an important component of these uh, investigations is in constraining the values of the parameter given A or B, I mean, their sensitivity on all fluctuations, etc. Do you have anything to say about the uncertainty in these? Because we often report them as a number without uncertainty constraint. And I mean, do you have a talking about like the Idaho example. Uh, example. So our n values, 30 different profiles, um, all of the granite and ice cover might be one outside of the uh, parameter. So yeah, we could, we could, and we, you know, we're calculating this well on eight years. Um, basalt has a little bit more variability on our sort of calibrated models, and we're allowing for uncertainties in our erosion rate estimates and things like that as well. 